Okay, and uh, hi everybody, and hello to all of you on our YouTube channel here at the Cypress Nest Tech Deck channel. Uh, tonight we are continuing our look at Eastern mysticism, um, or some of what uh, people call the Eastern religions, uh, with basis in uh, Eastern Asia for the most part. And uh, last week you may remember that we dealt with Hinduism. We also talked about the manifestation of many Hindu practices in the Christian church. And a couple of you commented on our page about that. And thank you for your input. And of course, we do welcome you to put comments down below. Also subscribe to our Tech Deck channel. We not only have our Wednesday night Bible studies here at uh, 18, uh, 28th and S Street in Sacramento, but we also have a live stream of our church services Sunday mornings at 10.30. We invite you to come in person. Also tonight uh, in the description down below, we have tonight's notes, and I'll be referring to these for everybody here in attendance. I would encourage you, if you're watching on YouTube, to download each one of these, uh, week five and week six of our Christianity, Cults, and Religion series. Uh, folks, what I want to start off tonight is talking on, if, on the week five notes, uh, number one, the three common threads of Eastern mystic, mystic uh, religions. These are the commonalities, even though when we talk about Eastern mysticism, we're talking about a wide, wide area of theology. This is extremely um, general, but they all seem to have kind of a, a, a origin in Hinduism, founded in, in India uh, many, many years ago, as we learned last week, perhaps as early as 1800 BC, the, 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 some of the Hindu uh, uh, religion practices got its start. And from that grew religions such as Sikhism, when we said last week that uh, the Sikh religion are people that uh, have, uh, have come to the United States, quite a number have, and there are large Sikh communities right here in the uh, Sacramento area. Next week we'll talk more about uh, Sikhism. And also next week uh, Robert's going to talk about Buddhism, and Buddhism is, has its roots again in Hinduism, but that is, Buddhism is something that is practiced more in the far eastern countries, such as Japan, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, areas uh, such, uh, of the country such as that. Now, one thing that uh, tonight we're going to be talking about are some outgrowths of, from Hinduism, okay? Our, and so I would encourage you uh, on, in your Christianity, Cults, and Religion pamphlet to turn to page 11, page 11, and the first outgrowth of Hinduism that I want to talk about is, is Hare Krishna. Now, you'll again, just as a recap, Hinduism, along with many of the Eastern mystic religions, at the top of your uh, notes, from week five, number one, involve pantheism. In other words, pantheism is many gods, the worship of many gods. Again, as we learned last week, the, the Hindus believe that there are as many as uh, 33 million gods. That's how many they say. Um, and we will, we will find out from, from when we, next week from when we study Buddhism that there really is no God, that God is, or there is, that the, the power of a almighty God is in each one of us. All right. B, the practice of these Eastern mystic religions are based around two things. The, their belief in reincarnation, in other words, when we leave this earth, we, when we leave this earth, we will return at a future date. And depending upon how we did 
this time around on earth will determine what happens the next time that we're here. Whether we are a person again, an animal, a bug, and you may laugh and giggle about that, but that's really what their belief of reincarnation is. It's all dependent upon, and you see the word there, karma. So the, thing, the good things that we do in this life is good karma, and as long as we treat everybody well, then that does well for us in perhaps our next life, but what the goal is of most, of most of these Eastern religions is that eventually the reincarnation ends and you live on as a god for eternity. Now again, I'm talking generalities here. Every one of these religions say it a little bit differently. Now, also a common thread is how do they worship? Now, of course, here at church, or a Christian church such as ours, we uh, gather together as like-minded believers. We fellowship with each other. We come in and sing praises to Almighty God. We have a prayer life where we pray individually to our God and receive inspiration from Him in many different ways. Most of the time, and I have my, I don't have my, I have my Bible here, most of the time we receive that inspiration through the Word of God. But that's how we worship as a Christian. For the followers of these Eastern religions, though, they participate in what they call meditation. Now, what that looks like, and we'll see it tonight in a couple of the videos, will vary according to what type of Eastern religion it is. So there is a time of dedicated meditation, and likewise, especially in Hinduism, and, and to a certain extent in, in forms of Buddhism, there is participation in yoga, which is a, um, and in a lot of you, and we talked about this last week, get, look at last week's teaching in case you're wondering about this, but yoga for the most part has its, has its basis in Hinduism. Now, the, what a lot of the uh, Kundalini yoga followers and, and participants do are things that we have found uh, resurface itself in the American charismatic church. The being slain in the spirit, shaking uh, uncontrollably, laughing uncontrollably, um, a lot of strange phenomena such as that, you'll see in the followers of Kundalini Yoga. But yoga, as we sort of have Americanized it, it's become a form of exercise. Would we agree with that, everybody that's here? Kind of a form of exercise. However, those who really practice yoga and those who uh, teach it always usually are Hindus themselves or followers of some kind of uh, Eastern mystic religion and they will institute a spiritual aspect into their yoga and that's the one that we as Christians need to be careful about. Okay, and for a lot of different reasons. We talked about that last week. If you notice on our week five notes, under C, Dangers of Yoga, there is a Vimeo video that I would encourage you to watch. And that's one that really goes into depth about the dangers of the spiritual side of yoga. Okay. So again, we're going to let, uh, next week talk about Sikhism, talk about Buddhism. But now at the bottom, page four, uh, our, our number four on our notes, more contemporary Eastern religions. And if you look at this, the Hare Krishna, the International Society of Christian Consciousness, Soka Gake International, and Transcendental Meditation, those three forms of Eastern religion, have their start literally within most of our lifetimes. Okay, I'm in my 60s with the exception of Soka Gake, which got its start in 1930. I'm not that old. So most of us that are in this room, inside of our lifetimes, 
these religions have begun. So they are very, what we call contemporary religions. I want to go to page 11 in our Christianity, Cults, and Religion pamphlet. And for those of you watching on YouTube, this is available through Rose Publishing and also available uh, from the Center for uh, Apologetic Research in San Juan Capistrano, California. You'll notice that the founder is a guy by the name of Bhaktivedanta Swami Prahobada. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Um, who began this International Society for Krishna, Con Krishna Consciousness in 1965 in New York City. He bases it on 16th century Hindu teachings. However, the headquarters for Hare Krishna is now in India, in Mayapur, India. They do have some inspired writings. Robert, help me on this. Isn't one of those uh, a, uh, a Hindu holy book? Um, I believe it is. Bhag, 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 Bhagavad Gita. Gita, yeah. I believe it is, but I know that he has added to it and, uh, and has, has written some other what he claims to be inspired scriptures. The God is, again, Lord Krishna, according to, the, this, uh, according to Hare Krishna, a personal creator. The souls of all living things are a part of that creator. And they also teach what Krishna does freely for his own pleasure, which includes being intoxicated and having sex outside of marriage, is prohibited to his devotees. When you were involved in Hare Krishna, the only time you are to have sexual relations is when you intend to procreate with a person of the opposite sex in order to have children. And that's the only time that that is allowed. Jesus really isn't thought of in this group. It's not a part of their religion. Usually, <laughs> they think of him as an enlightened vegetarian teacher who taught meditation. Okay? Um, some devotees consider Jesus to actually be Krishna, and others say, well, he's just a great avatar. That's the word that they use. And by the way, avatar is nothing more than, you know, um, avatars, for example, this little. Uh, this is my photo right here because this is my uh, YouTube, YouTube playlist. And so that is my avatar. Okay? So that's what the word avatar means. There is no teaching. In fact, most Eastern mystic religions have no teaching whatsoever uh, of uh, the Holy Spirit. There is nothing, nothing involved in the Holy Spirit. Now, Salvation, which to us as Christians mean a belief in the following of Jesus Christ, and His teaching, believing upon His resurrection, believing upon His word, uh, believe, uh, operating our lives according to His word, believing that He died, rose again uh, from the dead to as a remission for all of our sins. To a follower of Hare Krishna, salvation includes chanting. Krishna's name constantly, total devotion to Krishna, get this now, worshiping images and obeying the rules of ISKCON, ISKCON meaning the uh, Society of Krishna, Cons Krishna Consciousness, but you have to obey their rules throughout your many reincarnated life and finally, if you follow those rules to the T that releases a follower from bad karma. Now, we could have a quick discussion about this, and I'd like to hear your input. If you were a follower of Hare Krishna, and you read that, what I just read, what would be perhaps your biggest concern? about your eternal future. Reincarnation. 
Okay. How many times would I have to be reincarnated? Okay, how many times do I have to go through this life? This, uh, a life like this? Okay, that's a good question. How many times? What else? Why does Krishna make it so hard for me when he doesn't even have to follow these rules? <laughs> okay. How come Krishna is, acts one way and I have to act totally different? That's a good question. Is there another... I'll just put, I'll just, because I want to move along here, I'll, I'll, let me throw this out. How good is good? How, you know, how good is my karma in order to be accepted so that I end this cycle of reincarnation? How good is good? And that's the reason that Christ's death on the cross was final. It was done once and for all. It doesn't matter what you were like before you came to Christ. It doesn't matter what you did before you came to Christ or how ugly you were or how pretty you were or anything like that. It doesn't matter. God finished the redemptive work of sin, redeeming us from sin at the cross. Now he just says, follow me. That's it. It doesn't matter how good or how bad we've been. If, you, if you're a follower of him, you have eternal life in heaven. Does this make sense? Okay. So, again, think in terms of in these simple terms. When we look at all these Eastern religions, death, well, according to Hare Krishna, those who are unenlightened continue in endless reincarnation or rebirth on earth based on the sinful acts of a person's previous life. And again, does that mean if I got mad at my mother that I got to come back again as a bug? I mean, what, what's, you know, honestly, that, that, again, I don't want to make fun of anybody here and their beliefs, but that is the question I would have to ask. Now, other beliefs, public chanting of Hare Krishna Mahamatra, Yoga, food offerings, soliciting donations. That's, that was my first uh, exposure to Hare Krishna. I, as a young college man, I, um, my parents had moved to Louisiana, and I was still in college in, Cal, in um, Colorado. And I would frequently fly down to, down to Louisiana to visit my parents. I was all the time through the Denver airport, Hare Krishnas were all over the place and hitting us up for money and wanting to talk to us about Krishna. They were almost omnipresent in the Denver airport. And eventually they got run out of there. Uh, they, you know, because basically Christians were saying, well, if you're going to allow them, you're going to allow us. It became a war of words. And now there is no witnessing, at least at the Denver airport. But, you know, that, that was, of course, many, many years ago. Notice that four regulatory, regulative principles require the followers of Hare Krishna to follow a vegetarian diet. No intoxicants, no gambling, and again, as I mentioned earlier, sex for procreation only. New members are often attracted through feast and Indian cultural programs, and we're going to see that in, uh, in, in just a moment. And followers are given new names, new names, many of them change their name, and likely break fellowship with their family, their earthly families. Um, that being said, let's take a look now at a video that, w that will explain it a little bit more, give us a little bit of history. And the thing I like about this video is that this young woman who narrates it, does a really good job of editing it, and, and uh, I, I tend to think she's somewhat a follower, which is, and so afterwards, uh, listen with an open ear, make, be, make a note or two about something you've heard, and then we'll come back and, and talk, talk about it in just a moment. <coughs> Have you ever wondered how this all began? It all started with this man, Srila Prabhupada, when on October 9th, 
1966, he and his followers came to Tompton Square Park in New York to chant Hare Krishna outside for the very first time. And it grew from there. While Srila Prabhupada brought this chanting to the West, it was really introduced by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu of Bengal, India in the 16th century. Sri Chaitanya emphasized the worship of Krishna and believed that in addition to chanting the names of God, of which there are many by the way, they should also be chanted on the streets for the spiritual benefit of all. Hence why you see Hare Krishna is always chanting on the street. Chanting means to keep association with God always. So you have to audibly chant Hare Krishna. This is, this is uh, transcendental, transcendental vibration. This transcendental vibration or chanting is called mantra meditation. Mantra means to deliver or free the mind. The word Hare refers to the divine feminine potency of God. Krishna means the all attractive one and Rama is the reservoir of all pleasure. Hare Krishnas or Bhakti Yogis or Vaishnavas or devotees, these are all names for the same group of people chanting on the street. They believe that the sound vibration of the mantra has a direct impact on the soul, that it helps to spiritually awaken us like an alarm clock wakes us in the morning. Devotees believe that a person doesn't need to understand the language of the mantra. They believe that the sound vibration transcends the sensual, mental and intellectual levels of consciousness and puts one directly in touch with the spiritual. At this point, you might say, who cares about the spiritual? Well, everyone should care about the spiritual because we are all spirit souls. Let me elaborate. When you were born, you were a small baby, obviously. We grow from a baby to a child to an adult and hopefully into old age. Throughout that whole process, you are still you. You might gain some new skills, learn a new language, but it's still you doing that. You are driving your body. When I say this is my dog, this is my car, this is my hand, or this is my leg, I'm saying that I own these things. But these things aren't actually me. I am separate from them. If you saw me lying dead in front of you, I would imagine you would cry. Well, I would hope that you'd cry and say something like, She's gone! But in reality, my body would be right there in front of you. So really, the part of me that makes me me has actually left. Now that part of us some call our consciousness, the self or the soul. It is beyond physical perception because it's spiritual. If you understand this basic concept, then spiritual things might seem a bit more important, right? Because you would understand that you are actually spirit. This is the Hare Krishna's foundational understanding of life, that we are all spirit souls. There is no Hare Krishna without that understanding. The understanding that we need to awaken our spiritual awareness and identity. But we don't just have this life to do it in. When our body ends, our soul continues on to a new one. Until we become spiritually awakened enough not to take a material body again. Instead, we would go beyond this material world. But that is a whole other explanation, perhaps for another video. Now, this is not a sectarian faith in a lot of ways, because devotees have the understanding that when they pray to Krishna, or when members of the Abrahamic faith pray to Allah or Yahweh, they are all praying to one and the same person. This is my mother, or my mum, as I call her. Now, her first name is Judith, but she goes by Lindley or auntie, or auntie Lindley, or sister, or Miss Hutton. She has a lot of labels, but is still my mum. Just because we call someone by a different name, doesn't mean we aren't referring to the same person. I'm going to illustrate my next point using some scenes from a cute animation called Little Krishna. This is Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Also known by other names remember, <coughs> the Vaishnava faith, or the Hare Krishnas, are monotheistic. There is ultimately one God, but he can expand himself however and whenever he pleases. You might be wondering, why is he a small boy? Why is he blue? Why is he playing the flute? All good questions, but again, that's really another video in of itself. But if God can create this whole world, if he can create you and I, then why can't he do other things too? According to the sacred texts such as Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna oversees millions of demigods who are seen as administrators of universal affairs. These demigods are needed to run creation. They have a certain role, but just as a secretary of state reports to the president, 
These demigods serve for the pleasure of Krishna. It is for that service that devotees strive for. Now we serve people every day. Our mothers, our fathers, bosses, friends, partners, anything we do for them is a service. This service can bring such great joy. It's our nature to serve. And that's because we were originally servants of Krishna, or God, but have fallen asleep, so to speak, and forgotten about that service. On Mother's Day, I used to love making my mum a nice breakfast in bed of pancakes and coffee. Sometimes I'd get her a newspaper to read, or flowers too. I did all this because I wanted her to be happy, and doing that made me happy. This is similar to serving God, but in a much deeper and ever-growing way. Srila Prabhupada is a perfect example of a servant. He was fixed on the love of God. How else would someone of his age come to a foreign country, travel the world 14 times in 10 years, while also transcribing over 60 volumes of ancient Vedic texts to English, as well as training disciples, opening temples, and managing an ever-growing spiritual movement? As a young man, his spiritual teacher always encouraged him to write spiritual books in English and go to the West to teach people about the importance of chanting Hare Krishna. It wasn't until he was 69 in 1965 that he could board a boat called the Jaladuta and fulfill his teacher's request. He had translated the Bhagavad Gita in the very beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is rather long by the way. He hoped to finish translating the entire series of books before leaving his body. Srimad Bhagavatam consists of 18,000 verses spread over 12 cantos, which totals to 18 books. To put this into perspective, for some, the Bible consists of 23,145 verses in the Old Testament and 7,957 in the New Testament. Although the Bible has more verses, Srila Prabhupada also has commentary on almost every verse to help us with our understanding. He references numerous other texts from the Vedas, which is a large body of ancient Indian religious texts, by the way. What makes his work so nice to study and read is the fact that he has the original Sanskrit followed by the transliteration so that those of us who can't read Sanskrit can at least pronounce it. Then he has a word-for-word -word translation, then the whole translation, and then a purple. Unfortunately, he never managed to finish the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. He got to Canto 10, part 1 of 4, before leaving his body. But as I said before, during the 10 years he was transcribing, he was traveling the world, opening temples, looking after disciples, and also translating other books, such as Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is 11,519 verses. This book teaches about Sri Caitanya's life and his devotion to chanting Hare Krishna. That is a lot of translating he did before leaving his body on the 14th of November, 1977, aged 81, 11 years after he first left Indian shores to spread Hare Krishna in the West. And he certainly left a legacy. Most Hare Krishnas are part of an organization called ISKCON the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Srila Prabhupada incorporated this on the 13th of July, 1966, to formally begin teaching the West and the world about chanting Hare Krishna. For you to be officially part of ISKCON, there are a few requirements, six to be precise. There are four core regulative principles. The first is no meat eating, including fish or eggs. The second, no illicit sex. The third, no intoxication, including tobacco, caffeine and tea. And the fourth, no gambling. These principles are to help you stay focused on your spiritual practice, with your consciousness as clear as possible. I could go into details about those principles, but again, that's really a whole another video in of itself. So those four regulative principles need to be followed, as well as number five, chanting Hare Krishna. The official number is 16 rounds. A person uses mala beads, which consists of 108 beads to chant the entire Hare Krishna mantra on. The mantra is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And that is to be chanted another 107 times to chant one round. 16 rounds is considered the daily chanting standard, which can take between one and a half to two hours. Once someone is consistently doing this every day, or even before they reach 16 rounds, they should look for a guru. So number six is to find a spiritual teacher and take initiation from him. Or her. Last year it was officially announced that women can become initiating gurus, which is fantastic because it shows real growth in the society. Yes, I do believe that religions should grow according to time, place and circumstance. The essence of the philosophy is hopefully not lost, but some of the practical things could be altered according to what is normal in society. For example, women. In India, women were never allowed to be priests or on the altar doing deity worship. But when Srila Prabhupada came to the West, 
he allowed women to do those things, which was heavily criticized by Indians. But he knew that in order to grow his society in the West, he had to make some practical adjustments without losing the essence of the spiritual practice. When someone takes initiation, they vow not to eat meat, to refrain from illicit sex, not to take intoxicants or gamble. And they also vow to chant a minimum of 16 rounds every day. That makes a person an official Iskondabodi, and they also receive a new Sanskrit name, like Lavanya Kaili, which was my name, to remind you of your service to God. Lavanya Kaili Devi Dasi, for example, means the servant of Krishna's pastimes of beauty. Uh, she didn't really, I don't think, said, said exactly why she decided to become a follower. But when we're, when we're looking at, at something like this, do we not agree that there's, it's kind of like, wow, that's out there, that's totally foreign to us. It, 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 now, to a Hindu, a follower of Hindu, a follower of Buddhism, this might be something that they could easily follow. And it is, again, something that is totally foreign to anybody who's been brought up in the Christian church because nowhere in there does it talk about the grace of God. All it talks about is this works-based meditation. Okay? Now, uh, let's go to uh, page 12 in your booklet and we're going to change subjects and this is, you're going to find under 4b on our notes, uh, week 5 notes, th about a, another fairly new contemporary Eastern religion called Transcendental Meditation. Founded in 1955, likewise founded on, based on Hinduism and Karma Yoga, this Transcendental Meditation is based actually in the Netherlands. It was created by Maharashi Mahesh Yoga, who died just only uh, about 12, 13 years ago, 2008. Founded the Transcendental Meditation in India sometime between 1955 and 1958. If you notice that the Hindu scriptures, the Bhagavad Gita, we saw that in the, in the video we just saw on Hare Krishna is likewise used as a book of inspiration for the followers of Transcendental Meditation. Each part of creation makes up God, or Brahman, which is, again, a Hindu teaching. Supreme being is not personal. In fact, according to Transcendental Meditation TM, all creation is divine, all is one. Now, Jesus had a divine essence according to the followers of TM. Jesus is not uniquely God. We knew that in Christianity that, that Jesus is God incarnate. But according to the followers of TM, yes, he had a divine essence. Unlike most, he discovered it. Christ didn't suffer and couldn't suffer for people's sins. That, by the way, is a heretical teaching. If you drop down to salvation, you'll notice it says, humans have forgotten their inner divinity. Salvation consists of doing good in excess of evil in order to evolve to the highest state. Again, how good is good? That's what we said before. And when anybody or any of these religions that we talk about talk about works, you have to go to that question. Okay, well, how good then is good? According to those who follow Transcendental Meditation, um, the final union of the self with Brahman comes through reincarnation. Okay, so once again, we see the traits of, of Hinduism in TM, in another Eastern religion. Notice that death, reincarnation is based again on karma, reaping the consequences of one's actions until the loss of self into human union with Brahman. They don't believe in a heaven nor a hell. And now again, we want to remember that a lot of these Eastern religions claim that divinity, that we become gods. 
Unfortunately, there's a wing of Christianity that believes that too. We consider them to be aberrant in their, in their teaching that believers are little gods. But there is a wing of Christianity that likewise has the same belief. That's sad, but it's there. And finally, under Bibles or beliefs in others in our pamphlet here, it says that the followers of TM mentally recite a mantra, a word associated with a Hindu god, meditate twice a day to relax, and achieve union with Brahman. Again, meditation is key to, to a follower of, of TM, like it was for a follower of Hare Krishna. Maharishi University of Management in Iowa offers TM programs. Now get this, in levitation. Does anybody know what that is? Mm -hmm. Levitation? It's basically, spiritually, you raise yourself out of your body. This thing called astral travel, which many New Agers believe can happen, is, is, is that you're, through this intense meditation or intense mantra, you can actually leave your body. Your spirit leaves your body, which is a very dangerous thing. Because what happens if you don't go back? What happens if something else goes into your body? See, and that's the, that's the real danger to anybody who claims that they spiritually leave their body. That's what levitation means. Invisibility also. They teach invisibility. Practices include, again, here we go again with yoga. Hindu astrology. Use of crystals, and we'll see that also in the New Age movement in a couple of weeks when we talk about them, talk about the New Age movement. And idol worship, offerings of flowers, fruit, and cloth for Maharishi's dead teacher, Guru Devi. Um, let me just say that Transcendental Meditation has grown in recent years because of the number of celebrities that follow TM. Quite a number do. And they include Clint Eastwood, the great actor, and Ellen DeGeneres, who had a gentleman, and I want to go to this next video here, who talks about what Transcendental Meditation is all about. Number one, TM is a very simple technique. It's simple not because it's simplistic or a beginner's meditation, but because there's an elegant simplicity to the practice, very profound, elegant simplicity to the practice. Number two, it's natural. There's no manipulation, there's no suggestion. Every human being can practice transcendental meditation as well as every other human being. Very simple to learn and very enjoyable to practice. Number three, it's effortless. Effortless in contrast to many other meditation techniques which involve concentration or control of the mind, trying to clear the mind of thoughts. This is completely effortless as we'll see in a few moments. It's practiced 20 minutes, twice a day, sitting comfortably in a chair with your eyes closed. It can be done, you know, on a train. It can be done on an airplane. It can be done in a car. Someone else is driving. Uh, but it can be just done, it's just done sitting comfortably. It's a silent technique with your eyes closed. And this is what it's not. It's not a philosophy. I have no philosophy for you. When you learn Transcendental Meditation, no one's going to give you a TM philosophy of life. There's no philosophy whatsoever. It doesn't involve any change in lifestyle. You don't change your diet or anything. And the third thing is there's nothing to believe in. I want to emphasize that because sometimes people think, oh, when I learn to meditate, I have to believe in it for it to, for it to work. You can be 100% skeptical, and the technique works just as well. The benefits are just as profound as if you uh, went into this thing thinking, oh, I believe in meditation, that's, uh, it's going to work. So there's no belief whatsoever. So to understand what transcendental meditation is, and to understand how it compares to other forms of meditation or self-development, I like to use the metaphor or the analogy of an ocean. You're on a small boat, you're in the middle of the ocean, out in the middle of the ocean, and all of a sudden you get these huge swells, these huge 40, 60 foot high waves, and you can think, oh my god, the whole ocean is in upheaval. Well, not really, because if you do a cross-section of the ocean, you see these little 40 foot high waves, and the ocean is like, in reality, a mile deep, 
and the ocean is active on the surface, but at the depth of the ocean, it is naturally silent. That's the nature of the ocean, active on the surface, silent at its depth. And the analogy is our mind. The surface of our mind is the active thinking mind. <coughs> all the things that we're thinking about all during the day. It's like the waves on the surface of the ocean. And I like to call it the gotta, 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 gotta mind. I gotta do this, and I gotta do that, and I gotta call him, and I gotta call her, and I gotta make a list, and I gotta find the list, and I gotta make a new list, and I gotta get going, and I gotta slow down, and I gotta get to sleep, and I gotta wake up. We, I'm sure everybody's had a gotta, gotta, gotta mind at some point. And there's a natural inclination, a natural desire to have some, hu some inner calm, some inner clarity, some inner focus, some inner inspiration, some inner peace, some inner happiness, natural. And the operative word there is inner. And the question is, where is that inner, and how do we get there? Deep within every human being, deep within all of us, is a level of the mind that is already calm, already settled, already wide awake. The ancient meditation texts use very big words. They say it's a source of our unbounded creativity, unbounded intelligence, happiness, focus, clarity. What one thing that he said is that transcendental meditation is something that you're not to believe in, or something you don't have to believe in something. You could be a skeptical, skeptic. Well, that's not what Transcendental meditation, or, or the organization itself, is is teaching. Okay. In that, when we are to pray, what do we do? We pray to God. Yeah. We talk to God. We read as we're reading the Word of God, and He says something to us, such as. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he'll be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, and ready for every good work. Well, when you see that, or you read that, God speaks to you. I don't know if you guys, but when I was reading this, Something that said to me is, cleanse myself from what is dishonorable. That's kind of, and then right away you think in your mind, okay, I know something that I watched or something I was involved with that really was dishonoring God. That's, and you know, and just through reading his word, talking back to God, you know, God, I I just, being involved in uh, that, that, um, a uh, good time with my old buddies, my old drinking buddies. That really, I didn't honor you, Lord. I, you know, I help me stay away. Help me, help me find new friends, Lord. Help me stay away from people that want to dishonor you. Do you see how that works? Yeah. That's what Christian meditation is. That's what prayer is all about. What he's talking about here, yeah, it makes some sense. But he denies the fact that transcendental meditation has become a religion. And there are followers of it. So I could see some of the things he's talking about here, but he's denying the overall religious aspect that TM has become. Let's move on and maybe you'll have some more. Let's go to week six. Is, uh, on week six, our notes uh, notice number two, the New Age movement. Part of what this gentleman was talking about, transcendentalism, trans transcendentalism, spiritism, theosophy, that is finding God in everything, is a trademark of what we call today the New Age movement. 
There is no real organization. When you hear of the New Age as a Christian, you're not thinking of an organization like we do with TM, like we do with Hinduism, like we, you know, that there is kind of an organizational uh, headquarters or, or for, for that religion. Instead, what we're talking about is a school of thought that is involved in spiritual things, the things beyond the natural. It generally, if you look in uh, number two, letter B, rejects anything that is Orthodox Christianity. Now that would be what we do here at the First Church of the Nazarene. We would be considered as being something that a New Ager would completely reject, just completely have nothing to do with. Why then are they attracted? Why are followers of the New Age attracted to this spiritualism? They're, well, first of all, the idea that they can achieve personal godhood. Now, we saw that in Hare Krishna. We saw that, frankly, in Transcendental Meditation as well. We, the freedom to explore. See, there's a lot of warnings, I, I, even today, in my teaching. I've, I've been talking to you guys about, be careful about um, uh, astral travel, you know, spiritual, spiritually leaving your body. Anybody participates in something like that, is it's a very, very dangerous thing that could kill your spirit. <laughs> you know, and so I've been warning you about that. However, those that follow the, free, the, the New Age movement feel like they, they want to explore things of the spirit and spiritual things. They reject traditional religious approaches. They look for these techniques of enlightenment. And this is what, one of them that we just saw here with Transcendental Meditation. They also are looking for a unique method of physical healing. Unfortunately, a lot of people who find themselves terminally ill will search outside of traditional medicine and medical practices for that healing. And unfortunately, there is a lot of New Age-based remedies that are out there and available for people that, want, that are terminally ill or seriously ill. And then this idea that through following the, the spiritual life that's not based upon the Word of God, that's not based upon any written works or any, in, any works inspired by God, by following these spiritual practices that we can transform the planet. And for that matter, they believe any planet where there could be per people. All right. So this is, a, you, this is a very deep form of spirituality. The New Age movement, not connected to anything we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, but has a lot of the same thoughts as Hinduism, as Transcendental Meditation, as Hare Krishna. So let's take a look at our next video and our next video is one that is from Paul Cardin. We have, of course, the influence of Hinduism and Buddhism flowing in together with some other streams that have led eventually to what we understand as being the New Age. It was influenced by, for example, the 19th century transcendentalists. Maybe you read in school about Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Walt Whitman who developed a great affinity for the Bhagavad Gita and other ancient Hindu and Buddhist writings and began to spread their message among the average people here in the United States. There's the influence of spiritualism, of new thought, of theosophy, of Madame Blavatsky. Zen Buddhism especially is promoted by D.T. Suzuki and Alan Watts. And a number of guru movements, and all of this from the 19th century onward. I think the spirit of the New Age movement can be distilled by a funny song, which probably you've heard. It was a giant hit in the 60s. Harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding. No more falsehoods and or derisions. Golden living dreams and visions. Mystic crystal revelation and the mind's true liberation. Aquarius. Leading to a new era of consciousness. A harmonic convergence. An expectation a crazy idealistic exuberance that 
the world will undergo some kind of spiritual revolution that was foreordained and is inevitable. And that has taken many expressions, many forms. Along with all these various influences that I mentioned in the historical overview, you do have a calculated rejection of traditional biblical Christianity. So much of what we see in the New Age movement is an intentional renouncing of what was understood to be Christian. There's an emphasis on pantheism, as described before. Subjectivism. What's true is what's true to me. Individual autonomy. And a belief that all paths lead to God. There's a rejection of sin as the ultimate cause of evil in the world. And a co-opting of those elements of Christianity that people found agreeable. For example, many New Agers like to think that Jesus went to India or Tibet to learn from the gurus there and advance himself spiritually. In the New Age movement, we find a mix-and-match approach to spirituality. People freely picking up assorted beliefs and techniques as the mood strikes them, such as channeling, nature worship, UFOs. There is no single leader or central organization to the New Age movement, but there are many audience cults, what sociologists would call audience cults. They're not organizations in the formal sense where you have a membership card and a headquarters, but there are people grouped around public figures, around books. What is the attraction of the New Age movement? Personal godhood is very attractive to people. The idea that they can have ultimate control over their spiritual and material destiny is terribly seductive. The freedom to explore and to experiment spiritually, kind of go down the religious smorgasbord and have a customizable faith, and rejecting traditional religious approaches and structures, especially biblical Christianity. The possibility of learning techniques for enlightenment. Teach me what to do so I can become enlightened. There's so many people who are practicing various forms of meditation who weren't really interested in the philosophy behind them. They just want to relax. They just want to get on some kind of high. They want to gain some spiritual energy. Physical healing is also a major attraction in the New Age movement with alternative medicine and holistic health. But a lot of folks are into planetary transformation. It's not, not just all about them. They, they see the potential of combining spirituality and ecology. And this has become a powerful force that is not always acknowledged in the debates about policy that we see today. Not long ago, the Pew Forum, a respected research organization, determined that a quarter of Americans now believe in reincarnation, believe in yoga as a spiritual practice, not just an exercise, believe that spiritual energy resides in objects like pyramids and crystals, and believe in astrology. So the New Age has really taken hold on a deep level in our culture, like it or not. So how do we apply the Bible to what these folks are following? First of all, with the question of pantheism, as we've said before, the God of the Bible who discloses himself, not only in scripture but in nature, is personal. He's distinct from all that he's made. We see this in Genesis 1 and Romans 1. The Jesus of the New Age, who many people have tried to co-opt to make him seem somehow friendly to their beliefs, is not the Jesus of the Bible, who is God the Creator, who came to earth in human flesh, not merely as a guru or some kind of way shower. Jesus is the unique Redeemer who paid for sin and conquered death. Hindus, Buddhists, and New Agers deny the reality and the consequence of sin. You need to take them to Jesus and make it clear not just who he was by virtue of his deity, but why he took on flesh, what he came to accomplish on our behalf, that there is a gulf fixed between 
the one holy and righteous creator God, and us by virtue of our rebellion, our sin, which separates him, which separates us from him, hopelessly, unless there is a mediator. And that mediator is Jesus Christ, who accomplished on the cross what you and I can never do for ourselves by any technique of enlightenment. It's very interesting, the Dalai Lama has said that Jesus also lived previous lives, and he reached a high state through Buddhist practice or something like that. Don't let folks repeat those affirmations in a casual way without gently but firmly challenging them to read what the New Testament says about Jesus. The Bible affirms that human beings are personal and they retain their identities eternally. Jesus told us that the way to destruction is broad and the way to life is narrow and that he is the only way, he is the only truth and the only life. And we must realize what the Bible tells us. This law of cause and effect has no grace, no forgiveness. Not even the Buddha himself could intervene and prevent the consequences of one's karma. The idea of reincarnation undermines justice, morality, and individual significance. Christian apologist Mark Albrecht has uh, given a scenario in which Adolf Hitler, responsible for the deaths of millions of people in the 1930s and 40s, and the untold sorrow and misery of millions of others, dies in 1945. Two years later, a guy named Edgar Jones is born in his place. Edgar Jones has no idea that he was ever Hitler. But he is going to pay big time for what Hitler did. And the next several million incarnations of whatever had been Hitler will also be suffering for Hitler's sins without having the slightest notion of why they are paying for what Hitler did. Reincarnation isn't a fun idea, it's a curse. But what does the Bible say? In Hebrews 9, it says, It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. What we have in Scripture, in the witness of God's Word, is not reincarnation and endless succession of lives, but resurrection. We read in John chapter 5, Jesus telling us, An hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, God's voice. In John chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus says, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself, Jesus himself, will raise him up on the last day. One of the things that governs Hindu concepts of reality, of salvation, is that we are in massive cycles of time, of creation and destruction that go on throughout the throughout the ages, endlessly. But for the Christian, history is linear. It has a beginning and an end. And we must individually face the judgment. The hope of the Christian, as Paul expresses it in Philippians 3, is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. This is the Christian hope. That Jesus has conquered death and that he has made it possible for those who have placed their trust fully in him to one day conquer death as well and to live with him forever. In Hindu meditation, one is seeking to merge with the universal consciousness and vanish. In Buddhist meditation, one is seeking detachment from the world of experiences and eventually vanishing into the void. But in Christian meditation, the goal is attachment to the one true, personal, and living God. As the psalmist writes in Psalm 48, Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Hindus and Buddhists and New Agers are all seeking freedom from suffering, from the cycle of karma and rebirth. May God use you to show them the true and lasting freedom and love and spiritual power. 
comes through the enlightenment found in Jesus alone. Not in vanishing like a droplet into the ocean. Not in being extinguished like a candle flame. But the image of hope that the Word of God gives us through the mouth of Jesus is that of the prodigal son who returns to his father, who runs to meet him, who rejoices, who kills the fatted calf, gives him the gold ring from his finger, and orders a party.